good afternoon. Today, uh, Sherry and I are sitting down with Miss April Henze of uh, the NADA 911 Association. She is the 911 and PSAP Operations Director. April, how are you today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course. Out just to get just to get things uh, started off, April, give me an idea of how long you've been in the public safety industry. Oh wow! Um, I started in public safety uh, 31 years ago. It's coming, yeah, about 31 years now. So. Wow. Wow. And uh, always doing uh, dispatch, always with, what would where you start off with? So um, I started off actually at our local sheriff's office and I worked in our records department for a couple of years. Um, I did a part-time typist while I was in college. And then um, I had the opportunity uh, in 92 to move over to our 911 center. And um, I decided to take that opportunity, and um, I haven't looked back. No kidding. And where, and where was the local sheriff's department? Where are you from? So I'm, I'm from Michigan. Um, my local sheriff's office is Eaton County. So Eaton County is located, um, our county seat is in Charlotte, uh, spelled like Charlotte, but pronounced like Charlotte. Um, just because we're a little different here in Michigan. Um, but so it's close to Lansing. Part of the city of Lansing is in our county. Lansing is the um, state capital for the state of Michigan. Oh, awesome, awesome. I, I wasn't aware you're from Michigan. That's really cool. So you're from the small town in Michigan. You end up working for the Nina 911 Association. How does that come around? <laughs> Well, that's kind of a, uh, an interesting story. So um, I, I had the great fortune. I've had a very blessed career. Um, to be honest with you, sometimes you look back and you go, I don't even know how I got here. Um, but in this situation, I you know, worked my way up in um, my PSAP. So I started off as a telecommunicator, um, worked my way up to deputy director at the time. And as a new deputy director, um, I started uh, getting involved within NINA. So I, I went to my first, what they called uh, TDCODC, which was the Technical Development and Operational Development Conference, shortly after becoming a deputy director. Mm -hmm. And I sat on the very first, my very first working group that I sat on, we created the TERT standard. It was just after Katrina hit Louisiana, um, and we recognized at the national level how important uh, telecommunicator emergency response teams were going to be. Uh, up until that time, that wasn't even a thing. So I sat on that very first standard, and I kind of got bit by the bug and decided I was going to stay very involved within NINA. Um, I ended up during my tenure at Eaton County, I ended up as a committee chair within our operations committee. I did the operations, uh, I, I co-chaired both the public education and PSAP training committee, as well as the PSAP operations committee. And um, throughout that time, I got more and more um, involved in NINA. I moved up in my organization, became the director um, after uh, being the director at Eaton County for a couple of years, I ended up um, moving, uh, well, being recruited by a Next Gen 911 core services provider. And I uh, left the PSAP and moved over there as a, their director of industry affairs, um, continuing to stay very, very involved within NINA and doing all kinds of things at a national level. And um, when the opportunity arose, uh, the position opened up for the PSAP 911 and PSAP operations director at NINA. I applied. Um, it's been my dream job for probably as long as I was involved within NINA. I, uh, I absolutely wanted this position for a very long time. Um, and when it uh, was offered to me, I was extremely blessed to be able to take it, take it on and I'm going to do my very best to make sure that they never have another one until I retire. So. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's awesome. So 
what originally, uh, April, drew your interest into the public safety field? You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, when you first get out of high school, you're thinking, I don't even really, I, I thought I wanted to be an accountant. Um, and I took some classes and I was like, no, that's definitely not for me. I really don't like that accountant thing. So, um, yeah, my aunt actually, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my aunt actually worked at the 911 center in my county and she said, well, why don't you, while you're, you know, taking classes, why don't you work for the sheriff's office? They have, have an opening. Um, and I was able to go to work there for, they did back in the day, back at that time, they did this thing called a youth corps. And um, it was just a summer and kind of like an internship that the uh, state sponsored so that youth could get um, training and, you know, some work experience. So I worked for the sheriff's office for the summer and they, I did, I must have done well enough that they said, hey, we have a part-time typist position open in, at one of our substations. Would you be willing to take um, that position while you're, you're taking classes? And I went, yeah, that'd be fantastic because I, I can work nights and weekends and, um, you know, still take classes. And so that's what I did. And then um, towards, I guess it was uh, the end of um, 91, they had a um, position open up in, in their um, records department that was a full-time temporary position. And they offered that to me while, again, still taking classes. I decided I was going to go more part-time on my classes and, and continue to work. Um, so I went ahead and took that job and, uh, the more I worked at the sheriff's office and, and did the typing and worked in, in various different things, the more interested I became in that, uh, in the law enforcement and in public safety field. So, um, as I just, uh, when the position opened up, I was taking classes and I decided I was going to take at my local community college. They had a, um, a, public a, a 911 class they had classes for dispatchers and one of the classes i had to take required me to do a research paper um and do a sit-along at a 911 center so of course i knew my aunt so i said hey can i come in and, and do the sit-along and and i was hooked after that it was like this is really really interesting i really like this i liked the fast paced nature i liked all of the stuff that was going on so um, I decided, I said, well, I think I want to apply for the new, this job that's coming up. And she said, you know, I really don't want you to work here. You, I really would rather you not work here. And she said, you really don't want to do this job. And I said, mm, but I do. And she said, mm, but you don't. And I said, no, I really do. And I said, if you don't want me to apply here, that's fine. I'll apply at the, at, I mean, Ingham County is next door. I'll apply to Ingham County. That's not a big deal to me. So I went ahead and applied at both, and um, and the the person who happened to be the deputy director at the share, at, at the at Eaton County was the person who hired me in as part time typist up in uh, Delta Township. He had retired from the sheriff's office and became the wow. uh, deputy director, and he said, um, "Hey, I I want you," and I said, "Okay." So um, he says, I want you to apply, or I, I want to do, we want to do an interview, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I ended up getting offered the job. My aunt wasn't very happy, but um, long story, we ended up working very well together, and uh, eventually I became her boss, so. Wow. I can't imagine how that first went over, right? <laughs> well, it was interesting because, you know, initially she was my boss. And then eventually I became a supervisor. So then we were peers. And then um, then the transition to me becoming her boss, uh, that didn't, I mean, she, I, was, I think I was only her boss for a year or two before she retired anyways. But it was, it was definitely interesting, to say the least. No, that's, that's incredible. They had, actually had to have a family member really bring you into the field but it should argue with you she wanted you to just get some you know college you no know, job experience and it wasn't even her intention to bring you in here as a career path and you just got hooked from it it sounds like correct yeah absolutely absolutely 
That's that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so you worked for Ingham County. You were hired uh, under Delta Township. It was correct. No, I actually worked for Eaton County. Eaton County. Um, and I I was I oh, told her I was going to go to work for Ingham if she didn't want me to work at Eaton, and that was fine. But um, I did I did work for Eaton County, and I was actually there for my entire tenure. So. I started off in Eaton County in 90 and moved my way through up until 2016. I stayed there. So records department first, then the 911 center. And I trust me when I say there wasn't a single job in that 911 center I did not do. So I, I, I wouldn't doubt you, believe me. So can I ask you then April, um, when did you decide to make the choice to leave the PSAP? You said it was 2016, but I, I would say yep. that decision was pretty hard for you. You knew the people so well. When did you make that choice? It was it was really tough because, you know, when I, I absolutely love the people that I, I still love the people that are there. Um, I'm very fortunate to be able to have all of those folks still in my life. Um, and I, I go back and visit the, the PSAP um, as often as I can, but you know, it was at that, I was at that point in my career where you decide what is your next hill? How many more things can you do mm -hmm. in your career? Um, and I, I watched so many of my peers get bored within their, their careers. And then they kind of just fade away into the sunset. And I didn't want to do that. I really wanted to continue to be very relevant in the 911 community. I wanted to be able to continue to help those that um, I work with and that I care about. So, um, you know, I didn't, I was at the point where it was like, I've, there's not much more I can do here in the 911 center. I, I literally, there wasn't, the only thing I hadn't done in the 911 center um, before I left was update our radio system, but that was well underway. So it was just one more project. So was it really necessary for me to stay there for just one more project when, and, and quite frankly, I'm going to tell you, it took me a whole year to make a decision to leave. I, um, in, in 2015, mm -hmm. this uh, company had come to me at um, our Nina conference and said, Hey, um, we're interested in, uh, have you ever thought of moving out of the 911 center? And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Um, and they said, no, we really are interested. We would love for you to come to work for us. And I'm like, well, what would I do? And they said, well, we have some ideas, but w this would be a new position. It would be something we create just for you. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, long story short, I said, well, you know, I I'm honored and I really, um, and I'm humbled by all means, but I don't, my PSAP's not ready for me to leave yet. I, I have a lot more things to do um, to button things up before I can go. And they're like, okay, well, we'll wait for you. And I go, okay, sure you will. And, you know, the next year I go to the Nina conference and they say, hey, are you ready to leave? And I go, oh, wait, wait, you were really serious about that? And they're like, yeah, no, we're really serious. Um, and we really are interested. And I'm like, hmm, you know, I've kind of buttoned things up in the last year. Uh, maybe, maybe I am ready to leave. Well, why don't we talk more about this? Um, and another company that I work with had got wind that I was talking to them and they're like, Hey, wait, 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 I want to talk to you too. And I went, really? So long story short, I had two different companies coming to talk to me at the same time and that actually really worked out in my favor because I got a better rate a better pay moving into the um, public sector that way but um, it, it worked out really well I I was very very fortunate uh, the company I went to work for is outstanding they're doing amazing things and I still to this day will do anything I can to you know um, provide uh, any input I can when it comes to standards or, or whatever it is they need. Um, so I'm, I'm very blessed, but it was, it was definitely out of the blue. I didn't expect it. It wasn't something I was looking to do, um, but it, it happened and 
I was able to take it. I guess I took advantage of it. So, but it took me a year to make the decision. <laughs> I I can imagine how how hard that must have been to make that decision. But can I can I ask uh, a little more about that job then? What was it about the position that they were creating for you that actually really appealed to you? Well, they allowed me to continue to work in the industry and advocate for 911. So I can I was still very, okay. very involved within Nina. That was a big passion of mine. Um, I was still involved and I got to be a little bit more involved in um, working with the FCC and other national program, um, like the 911 program office. And, um, and then I did a lot of speaking. So I did a lot of speaking engagements across the country um, at local conferences. Um, obviously, at the, I continued to speak at annual conferences. Um, so that was really beneficial to me is that I wanted to be able to advocate for 911 and um, continue to move the industry forward. And th I had that opportunity there because I was able to not only help 911, but then I also was able to give input into their own products and services and how to how to work with the 911 centers and gain trust and and things like that for that organization. So. Okay, so really one of the main drives was the ability just to continue to help out the industry in any way possible, correct? You yep. just you love that drive. That's, yep, that's that's the that's, that's my goal. Make sure nine one one is well taken care of. Make it a better place than when I when I started. I want it I wanna make sure I leave it in a better place than when I started. Which I think I've already done, but I mean much better, let's put it that way. Well, I mean I can imagine the place where a way dispatch looked in the nineties versus 2021. I bet they look very similar. Uh, don't they? Yeah. Uh, no, not even a little. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. No. So when I first, yeah, when I first started in 911 and, and my county was quite advanced at the time when I first started in 911, we had mm -hmm. just turned up our CAD system. Um, which was an AS400 platform. Uh, most people won't even understand what that is nowadays. It's definitely not office-based. It's not Windows-based. Um, so, yeah, Sherry knows. She, she's shaking her head yes over there. But those systems were definitely, um, yeah, they're definitely not what they are today. Um, so, and, and we had actually just turned up 911 in our county in 1992. Uh, January of 92 is when we turned it up in Eaton County, and um, June of 92 is when I started. So, uh, and, and when I'm talking 911, I'm talking wireline, right? And wireline was, you know, brand new. We did have enhanced 911, um, but I still remember those big box computer screens and um, with the green, you know, the black screen with the green um, writing on it. Um, it was, you know, very, very new. Computers were still pretty darn new at that time. Um, and we didn't, you know, there wasn't a lot that we had to do. 911 was not very prevalent at the time. People didn't know to call 911 for everything. Like and today, 911 is, is such a household name that um, it's, in, in many ways, it can be overused, right? People are calling 911 for things that back then they never would have dreamed of. And most of them didn't even dream of calling 911 for an ambulance um, back at that time, right? So they would just load their loved one up in a, in a car and take them to the hospital. Um, so it's very different today. When, at what point did you notice, like, when did those big changes really start to happen? Like, well, like what time and what were, like, the biggest changes you noticed in the dispatch, like, over the last 30 years? Oh, that's they, most changes really kind of happen more gradually. Um, we really, you know, as mm -hmm. the computer systems got better, think, you know, you start to add mm -hmm. new things, little things here, little things there. CAD system got better. Um, eventually, we got wire or wireless, right? So you started off with wireless. Wireless started off kind of slow mm -hmm. because not everybody had a wireless phone. 
Um, about towards the end of the 90s is when wireless phones started becoming more and more prevalent, and that's when we really started to see the ramp up of 911 calls. Um, wireline 911 calls have never been huge. Um, wireless ended up moving. That was a massive explosion in the industry that I think um, that did ramp up gradually, but it still ramped up. Um, call volumes definitely um, increased. And then trying to find those people, right? Because initially the way 911, uh, wireless 911 came about, you know, there, you're, you didn't even get a phone number to call back. It was just basically a call call forward to the the three digits of that um, a ten digit call forward. Nine one one was a ten digit call forward. Um, but eventually they moved that uh, into allowing us to have um, phase one, and then eventually phase two. And as um, you know, the FCC has required more and more from the carriers getting better and better location information. But back in the day, and I know Sherry can attest, when wireless first started, um, I can remember having to walk people back through how to, where they were at because, I, you know, you'd get a call in the middle of the night. I, I can think of one call in particular that I received. Um, a young man uh, called me, uh, was sounded very tired, very sleepy, he had just been involved in an accident, and he um, so and he had no idea where he was at. He fell asleep at the wheel, so he didn't know where he was at. He was in a rural area, um, so you had to walk him backwards, right, to figure out well where were you last at. Well, the last thing I remember was I was at a I had gone to a, con a concert with my sister and her friends. Um, we were driving home. I fell asleep in the back seat. When I dropped, when they dropped me, um, when we dropped them off, I got into the front seat and left. Okay, well, where was that at? Well, that was at my sister's house. Where does your sister live? My sister lives here. How do you, you and you, were, where were you heading? I was heading home. Okay, how do you usually get home? Because people are not going to deviate when they're really tired. They're not going to deviate from the norm. They're just going to go by what they usually do at that time because they just don't think it. They just, autom they go on autopilot. And that's exactly what he did. He left her house, drove down the road, and ended up in the ditch because he fell asleep at the wheel. And he he was injured, so he couldn't get out of the car and go um, look to look around to see where he was at. So what we had to do is we had to backtrack from where the sister was at to where he goes home, right? And this is his normal route, and that's how we found him. But those are the things that nowadays – a lot of our call takers don't even think about because they didn't have to, right? But you, how how we had to find people back then was very different than what you would necessarily do today. Um, and today we have so many other things. They have so many things thrown at them um, between, you know, uh, you have all different kinds of 911 calls, and each one of them have different location information that they have to deal with and how they mm – -hmm how they process that different location information. And then um, anything from an app that can call 911, which I know a lot of people don't realize, but we do have that. We have apps that are calling 911 um, for all the way to, you know, to a wireless, wireline, voice over IP, um, multi-line telephone systems, and the list goes on and on and on, right? So mm -hmm. trying to figure out that information just on the 911 screen alone is overwhelming. And then you add to it all of the other databases, all of the other analytics that they have to put into that um, call today. It's It can be overwhelming, um, which kind of leads into how do we keep these people long term because there's so much they have to learn um, and what what why would they want to stay if they're not getting good pay, if they're not getting good benefits, if they're um, overwhelmed with stress, et cetera. So lots of, lots of things you have to, to juggle today in 911, but you didn't have to juggle in, in the early 90s. Uh, I just want to ask a couple questions about your career path um, because you're talking, I mean, you and I have been in the industry, you know, for the same time we've had similar career paths uh, and the technology changes mm -hmm. have been pretty amazing. I met you in 2006 
I distinctly remember the Nina conference we were at when you had those job offers. Um, and I was really sad because I knew you weren't going to be in Michigan as a director, but um, I'm happy that you stayed so involved. Um, but you mentioned classes a lot while uh, when you were first starting. Did you finish and earn a degree, or um, and do you think that that helped you progress in your career? You know, honestly, I did not finish. I ended up. Um, I, I have enough. I couldn't. I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. When I was in college, um, so I took a lot of classes. Um, I have probably enough classes to have an associate's degree, um, but not in a any one specific um, uh, field. So I didn't end up doing that. Um, and in some ways, that actually. Uh, hindered me because um, moving up the chain, it was not easy to do. Um, somebody like me, I had to really prove myself. I really had to, I will tell you today that I have a, at least a master's degree in 911. Um, I really have, I, I, but that's because I have taken on all, as much learning as I could possibly learn about and just um, done everything I could in the 911 field. Um, that being said, there isn't a 911 degree, right? So um, it's right. if I were to have gotten a degree, if if I had to have something that really interested in me, um, unfortunately, I did not stay in that that uh, path. I didn't finish out uh, my schooling, um, and like I said, it did kind of hinder me because. You know, when I first applied, the first time I applied for the deputy director position, well, I didn't have the, the education. Um, but it said you had to have an equivalent or equivalent, right? So then I had to prove that I had the equivalent, right? I, I knew what I was doing. I knew the, the um, industry. I knew the 911 center. Um, so then I, it, and then I took a lot of classes for, um, I took additional classes like business management classes and things like that, and just not enough to get a degree. Um, so I got my, I, I became the deputy director, but I was the deputy director for, I'm trying to remember when did I become the deputy director? Um, I was the deputy director, I think for about 13 years before I moved into the director's position. And I only held the director's position for three years before I left Eaton County. So um, it took me a long time to, to really be able to, you know, prove myself that I was, I was capable of being the director. And, um, and like, and I had to be one of the things I, you know, I think a degree kind of helps you with, sometimes when you have a degree, people just automatically give you the respect. They automatically say, oh, you're smart, you're knowledgeable, you have, have a degree. Um, well, I didn't have that, so I had to earn it. Um, and I had to earn it the old-fashioned way with blood, sweat, and tears. And I had to walk into any room I was in and be the smartest person in the room. I had to be able to um, articulate everything I needed to articulate. I grew up in a world where it was very male-dominated, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it is what it is. Um, when you are in a, a field, when you're in public safety, oftentimes the people who are in charge of police, fire, and ambulance organizations are male. Um, and and back when I started, it was a good old boys network. So to do those kinds of things, I really, really had to prove myself. Um, I think today, most of the, a lot of the people that we're hiring in the 911 centers definitely have degrees, which will benefit them. Um, but not all degrees are created equal, right? So I can remember hiring people who had a fisheries and wildlife degree. Um, I hired people who had a teaching degree. I hired people, I hired a lawyer once, who by the way, didn't make it through the 911 training process, but that's because she overanalyzed everything. Um, so, you know, we hired a lot of people with a lot of degrees, um, but the degrees aren't always gonna get you everything. So. If you really want to move up in a 911 center, have a degree, but also learn as much as you possibly can about 911. And I'm not just talking about um, how to take a call. 
I'm talking about the technology. Um, I had uh, somebody once tell me that, because I, I was an operational person, I only need no operation. And I was told very distinctly, oh, no, 911 is much more than operation. You need to be able to operationalize the technical side of 911, and that will make you much more marketable. And that was probably the best advice I could have ever gotten to move my career forward. That is good advice. Uh, and um, I was thinking, you know, when you, when we were talking uh, when you and Zach were talking and you were talking about the technology when 911 started. And I re I remember all those, all those kinds of stories, you know, from where I was working too. Um, and now then you were talking about the, the pay and the job responsibilities and why would anyone want to do this? And I, I think there's a lot of people like you and myself who just really want to make a difference and, and, um, you know, make a difference for people and make the field better. Uh, but there's more changes coming. And um, that was oh, one yeah. of my questions. There's the, the strong movement across the country for NG911, Next Generation 911. What do you think that change means to 911, you know, everywhere? Well, um, it's, it's, in so many ways, it is a very, very needed important change. It is extremely uh, beneficial in um, the ability to be able to have resiliency, redundancy, and reliability within the 911 networks. It's extremely important to be able to reach and talk to people um, from every modality, right? So we have to remember that uh, people are how we communicate today is vastly different than how we communicated that 30, 31 years ago, right? 31 years ago, our primary means of communication was on a wireline telephone. Um, we had to dial long distance to get to, you know, our community next door, et cetera. Um, and today we have this wonderful smartphone devices at our fingertips that um, can do anything they they're actually more powerful our smartphones that we have today are more powerful than the computing power it took to put the man on the moon so if you really think about that device and all of the things it can do it's kind of crazy um you know between you've got text you've got real-time text you've got video you've got voice you've got apps you've got all of this off and it's all going to continue to evolve because you know technology is not going to stand still. Now one has to stay up with the times now as opposed to the other way around. And um, we just have to be able to we have to be able to do those things. Um, and the more information, the more data we receive, the better the response um, the responders can have. So there's there's so much good, all of the data and all the yummy stuff that can come in, right? But on the flip side of that, there's also a lot of things that we have to really think about and start planning for um, and doing a better job of. And that is one, the first thing is caring for the person that's taking the call. We have done a, um, from the very first time I walked into the 911 center, the first um, hard call I had, you know, I was basically told, put your big girl panties on, girl, and keep on a moving because we don't have time for this. You just keep moving. And I went, okay. And But there's a point where you can't do that anymore. Um, and nobody ever really told me that, yes, okay, they told me, you can't share anything that you hear here. You can't, you're not allowed to share. Um, but what's one of the best ways for you to de-stress at the end of the day? talk about what happened, right? Um, they also right. told you that you just need to keep moving forward. You don't have time for this stuff. You're right. So what do you do? You just push it aside to push it aside. Nobody ever told me. Well, I had one person tell me, you know what? You put your 911 hat on when you walk in the door. And when you walk out of the door, you take your 911 hat off and you go home and you, and you have a different life, right? Don't mix the two. They did tell me that. Um, but those are things that are kind of like 
conflicting, right? So there's so many different conflicting messages you're told, and nobody ever said, it's okay on the way home to cry and say, I had a bad day. Nobody ever really told you that. So you're like, I have to be a big girl. I can't, I can't feel these feelings. What's wrong with me? And after a certain amount of time, you end up having PTSD because you don't deal with all of these traumas. Um, 911 professionals deal with more vicarious trauma in their careers than any other public safety profession. And why is that? Because public, other public safety professionals, they respond to a call and they deal with that call until it's done. They go back, they do the report, right. and then they get back on the road, right? So they have time between all of these calls throughout the day. So a typical law enforcement officer, at least in Eaton County, would take, you know, process maybe on a busy day, somewhere between five and eight calls. For service, some of them would be really big. Some of them would be not so big. On a on a really busy day, it would be a lot higher than that. Um, but point is, is that the type their calls, the process time, they have time downtime. Same thing with ambulance. Same same thing with fire. They've got some downtime after they dealt with that call to process that call before the next one. Number one doesn't have that luxury. We go from call to call to call to call and it can be a barking dog it can be cpr in progress it could then go to an armed robbery and then back over here to grandma calling because she's lost her her dog and she's beside herself so you don't you don't know what you're going to have it's this mix and you just keep going and going and going and going and nobody ever told me throughout that day that it's okay at the end of the day to go oh my gosh, that was just the, that one call really hit me hard and I just need to be able to cry about it. I just need to be able to process that. No, I just kept pushing it aside until my box got so full that it kind of burst open. And um, those kinds of things, I, there is an anomaly one professional that doesn't deal with some of that eventually. Um, so taking care of those people is absolutely crucial because as we move into that next generation 911 and you've got all of this other stuff coming all of the other data you might be able to see things that you never see had never seen before um how do you process those things will you process those things by taking care of the individuals in the seat that are doing that job um and you make sure that they have those the tools that they need to be able to process those internally um, by saying it's okay to have a bad day and it's okay to go home and cry about it because that is healthy for us. That That is nature's way of helping us heal um, by processing that stuff. Um, but it's going to be really important for us to do that because in the next gen world, we're going to have a lot more stuff coming at us that we haven't necessarily dealt with before. Um, and so right. taking care of ourselves today is important, um, but taking care of ourselves moving forward is even more important with all of the stuff next gen is going to provide us. Right. And, and next gen is going to come, you know, whether the PSAP wants it or not. So, um, you know, those programs, uh, the peer to peer support and, um, those wellness programs are, are really critical for every PSAP. Uh, and I know there's a lot of dispatchers out there who look at ne next gen and they're saying, I don't want to see that. I don't want to do that. But, uh, and, and it's not exactly the same, but when uh, local number portability started being discussed, I remember, well, I don't want that to come because, you know, how will I know where people are because we used the area code? Do you remember those days? Yeah. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, actually, in some things, you know, you've got 988, you've got 988 coming in right now, and 988 is going to use that area code. That's what they do. That's how they put, they still use the area code to determine who the PSAP is. And as you well know, that is not the best way to do it because of number portability. No, I was actually going to talk to you about 988. Um, 
it might be a new topic to a lot of people. How do you see yeah. it changing the face of 911? Oh, that's another great question, Sherry. That's, these are these are things that we could talk hours and hours on. So I think 988 is actually going to be very beneficial. Um, 988 is uh, what it is, for those who don't know. Um, 988 is the new National Suicide Prevention Lifeline uh, telephone number. It's going to be more than that, though. Um, they're looking towards uh, behavioral health issues as a whole. Um, as that number becomes, uh, is required. So the FCC required that all carriers um, deploy 988 by July 16th of 2022. What that is, is, is basically, it's if you look at what 911 was back in the early 90s, it was a basic call forward to a 10 digit line. So 988 is going to do exactly that. It's going to be a basic call forward to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline's 800 number. Um, and then they will uh, route those calls based on area code to the most appropriate uh, suicide prevention lifeline uh, center or not now going to be 988 center. And initially, I think it's going to be, we're, we are going to deal with this in the same manner that we've always dealt with suicide prevention um, calls, the lifeline calls. We'll have to still continue to do the, um, you know, probably a reverse lookup. They're only going to get the telephone number of the caller. Uh, if they don't know the location of the caller, they will have to um we, the 911 center will have to do exigent circumstances lookups on the, the uh, telephone number, getting law enforcement involved, et cetera. Um, they can, that, and, and that call may or may not be in that PSAPS area. Um, well, they can use the MENA's Enhanced PSAP Registry and Census. Uh, all you have to do is request the access to it. It's a free portal for 911 centers. They, you go in, access it plug in an address and that will tell you what the most appropriate PSAP is and give you a 10 digit telephone number to be able to transfer the call to. That being said, there's going to be um, moving forward, I think there's some really big advantages where 911 and 988 are concerned. They're going to have behavioral health people within those, um, in, within their call centers. 911 is quite frankly, um, most of us are, are going to tell you that 911 is not necessarily the best place to call um, for suicidal uh, ideations. They don't have all of the behavioral health resources that 988 is going to have for these people. You know, if, they, if they're having, a, um, having any type of uh, behavioral health crisis, they will be able to connect them with the right people to get them help. That's not what 911 does. 911 responds in emergencies. So they can send police, fire, EMS, um, and in some areas, uh, they even have uh, very few, but some areas, 911 does have behavioral health specialists sitting in the 911 centers today. And some of them even have um, different types of unarmed response uh, res teams that they can send to help mitigate these situations. But that's few and far between across the country right now. But 988 will have more of those resources for these people. So I'm, I foresee in our less, not in our urban areas, because most of the major urban areas are creating these within the 911 center and having all of this stuff. But in a lot of in our rural areas, our extremely rural areas who don't have the resources, um, I could see a situation where they may transfer that, nine, that suicidal caller to 988, maybe even stay on the line with them, ensuring that they don't need a or emergency response from, um, you know, police, fire, or EMS, but letting 988 deal with that person because they are much more apt and able to take that call and handle it appropriately. Um, I, I perceive there being some synergy there and some um, 
working relationships that are going to come in. Um, how that's going to work, we have to figure that out. Um, and I'm just going to kind of put a plug in here because, uh, Nina, we are working on um, a standard, a 988-911 interaction standard that we're just starting. It's, uh, the working group is, has not even been announced yet. But we're getting ready to um, put out for a call for volunteers to have people join us in creating some of that information because we need to understand um, the technical side. What will it take technically for 988 and 911 to, in, to interoperate? And then we also need to do the same thing on the protocol side. Um, what kind of protocols can be put into place for handoffs, either to 988 or from 988 to 911, what types of things do we need to do? Um, are, are there memorandums of understanding that need to be put into place between these two? So we're working that, um, and it, it, there's going to be a lot of change, I think, an evolution here um, in the coming months and years. Hopefully, the FCC will even um, rule that 988 can have geolocation and even allow for text to 988, we'll see, so. Yeah, I, I agree, and it, it, it does make me slightly nervous that they're, the, the way they're routing the calls, well, one of the tools they're using is the area code, uh, because I know a lot of people who have moved all the way across the country and they don't want to give up their number, and there's nothing in, in right. place that says you have to, so um, that, that could be a challenge. That, yeah, not just that, though. I mean, sure, we've got people. I mean, how, I am on the road all the time, right? So if I am in right. Alexandria, where our home office is, you know, we have people travel. And um, between number portability and the amount of travel that Americans do on a daily basis, you're oftentimes people are not going to be within their same area code. Um, so it does become a problem. Yes. Yeah, which is one of the reasons uh, text to 911 was uh, fast-tracked because uh, people who are deaf or hearing impaired, uh, they have, you know, we used to have those old, old uh, machines and that number that we could use. Uh, and even the interface with the uh, CPE, with the phone equipment, um, that didn't work if they didn't have their side set up properly. So texting was really mm -hmm. a push back then. And so now we're seeing it more prevalent, but even texting isn't nationwide. Right. So, you you know, you so mentioned that NG911 at this point. Yeah. At this point, when it comes to next gen 911, we've got about 40 to 50% of the U S that are either in a transitional phase or moving in uh, or planning phase of next generation 911. Where text to 911 is concerned, we're probably pushing about 60% of the, the nation um, being able to text 911. Um, but we still got a long ways to go, right? There's so many modalities out there. And, and you know, one of the things that people, um, you know, you talk to anybody in a 911 center and they're they're automatically saying things like, I don't want pictures. I don't want video. Um, well, you know, we right. have text now, right? We have real-time text. Uh, but when it comes to video, you know, I I'm sure this is the same for you. You've got grandkids. My, I have grandbabies who do not call their mimi. They don't call her on the phone. They FaceTime her. And these are, this is a whole yes. new generation that is growing up very comfortable with video. Video is going to be their, probably their primary means of communicating with each other. Um, and as we move forward, we have to be able to communicate in the modality that people are most comfortable with. One way or another, there is going to be, we are going to have to figure these things out. Where next gen is concerned, the beauty of next gen is that the technology will help us with some of this. So, you know, one of the things I think we're going to start to see in the not so distant future is that um, 
we'll, we're, we're going to start to see artificial intelligence built into these systems that will help us in augmenting, right? So they see you, if you get a video call, one of, one of the things that I've heard people say is, well, first of all, they don't want to see it, right? But second of all, right. they are afraid that they're going to miss something, right? Because we multitask. We are constantly, we can't just be completely in the video, right? We're going to have to be able to be typing what we're seeing, notifying the responders, et cetera. So we're doing all of these things all at one time. Um, where artificial intelligence is concerned, well, now you miss something. Maybe AI can help you with some of that stuff. If, if, they, if it's noticing something in the background that is important, it's automatically putting that in your CAM system. There are so many things that technology will be able to do to assist us, not take over, but assist, um, that we have to be willing to embrace some of those types of technologies um, because they're going to be very beneficial for us uh, long term. And when I say, you know, when I say people don't want to see it, they, uh, some of them will say, I came into the 911 center because I didn't want to see or smell things. That would have been me. Um, but I am going to tell you that of, if we're going to be considered a first responder, we are going to have to deal with things that other first responders have to deal with. And we're going to have to figure out how best to help our staff to train our staff, to prepare our staff, and then to keep them healthy, mentally healthy um, with what they're going to deal with. That's absolutely correct. And I, I wasn't even going to bring up artificial intelligence because it is such a big, big topic. Uh, but I have to agree, you know, you look at our workforce and um, those that are in their 20s and you know late teens and then all the generations behind them they're probably going to be a little more comfortable with video and more accepting of AI and um, just the whole workforce Absolutely. will change and so us people who have been in the industry for a while I don't want to say we're old but uh, we have to be able to adjust to those changes as well right. or you know we're not going to make the difference that we wanted to make when we got in the field. Yep, absolutely. So, um, April, as we as we wrap up here, uh, we've talked about the changes that uh, we know are coming. And uh, is there anything you want to want to add? Uh, I you've had an incredible career path. You know that I mm -hmm. I uh, I've always looked at your career path and and your just your passion. It's, it's very inspiring. So where, where do you think from here that we're going? Well, you know, I think for me, um, and I appreciate that, Sherry, right back at you, sister, you and you and I have had, uh, we've known each other <laughs> for a long time. And I'm very, very uh, fortunate to have had our, our career paths um, so closely entwined. Uh, and I, I, I definitely think of you as a mentor. Um, I think in when I, where 911 is concerned, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, and I think that remember that in this field, you own your own destiny. And to, if you get involved, if you're passionate about what you're doing and you want to make a difference, you absolutely can. And there are so many different ways for you to do that by just simply starting off in your own PSAP, joining special teams, because every PSAP has some, some special team. Join a special team. Get your feet wet. Learn as much as you can about your 911 center. And then move on to maybe local or state or national organizations and start to get your feet wet there. Um, you have... You are a subject matter expert. If you have been in this field for more than five years, you know what you're doing. Um, learn more, get involved, and take control of your own career because that's how you take control. The more you learn 
the more you share. I um I recently I just I was just at the Michigan 911 conference and I I just did a session on leadership and um part of that part of being a leader in the 911 industry is being willing to work closely with others and share your knowledge and and provide others with inspiration and Part of that is knowledge, right? Learning as much as you can. Learn and share and grow. And don't ever stop learning, sharing, and growing. Excellent words. Thank you. Thank you, April. We're so um, honored that you came on with us today. Thank you so much, April, for doing this. Yeah, no problem. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. Uh-huh.